Hello, and welcome to Composite Bodies, an interdisciplinary and interinstitutional series that interrogates questions of embodiment, technology, surveillance, and power from an intersectional feminist lens. I'm Caroline Light, a senior lecturer in Harvard's program in Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality. And on behalf of my seminar co-convener, Patricia Williams, I want to begin today's event by expressing our profound gratitude for the generous support of all three of our co-sponsoring institutions. Thank you to Northeastern University's Humanity Center, to Harvard's Mahindra Humanity Center, and to Harvard's program in studies of women, gender, and sexuality. We also want to extend a very special thanks to Gabby Fiorenza and to Jen Greaves for their indispensable technological and administrative support for this specific event. And thanks also to Mary McKinnon and Stephen Beal of the Mahindra Center for their generous ongoing guidance and support throughout the year long series. And speaking of generous, I wanna thank all of you for being here with us today for our third event um, in the Composite Bodies series. I hope you'll consider joining us for the next event, which is taking place on March 10th. And that is a conversation with Karen Barad and Daniela Gandorfer, the title of which is Entangled Nuclear Colonialisms, Matters of Force and the Material Force of Justice. At any time during this event, we welcome you to submit questions using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. In the interest of time, please try to keep your questions rather uh, brief and to the point, and we promise to do our very best to get to as many questions as possible in the course of this one hour long event. And now it is my tremendous pleasure and honor to turn things over to Professor Patricia Williams. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Um, and thank you, Gabriella and Jennifer as well. Um, it is such a pleasure and a genuine honor to introduce Professor Lynn Terrell, whose work I have admired for at least two decades. Um, it has sometimes said that philosophy is an abstract body of learning, but Professor Terrell is among that cohort of philosophers whose ideas have direct and salutary application in public life, and never so much as today. Her entire body of work on the corruption of political speech and the norming of hateful ideas has been entirely prescient and honestly not nearly heated enough. She has warned us repeatedly of the danger that the incremental propaganda of disparagement poses for our collective future it's a danger many of us believe was on particular and unfortunate display last January 6th. Against the backdrop of battles about culture wars and the limits of First Amendment free speech, her truly grounded commentary on everything from the Rwandan genocide to Rush Limbaugh makes us pay attention to semantics and the opaquely layered rhetoric that frames conceptions of living subjects, legal persons, non-persons, and things. Her inter interrogations, while located within the philosophy of language, are tremendously helpful in thinking about how certain traumatic histories keep repeating themselves. Her studies are starkly illuminating counters to the oversimplified bromide that words can never hurt you. Her meticulous history of the propagandistic radio transmissions in Rwanda show precisely how power is accumulated through the double register of political speech how officially crafted perceptions of threat worked to crystallize contempt toward fellow citizens, how it rewrote public memory, pressed down upon cultural anxieties and ultimately sharpened such narratives into knives, then actual knives, actual hatchets and actual machetes. In her most recent work, Professor Terrell has been linking the power of toxic language to epidemiological models of contagion. She frames persistent public derogation as a public health problem in which hateful phrases spread 
and can be tracked according to predictive patterns that divide groups, make people think the group division is natural, and then encourage the use of derogatory terms to refer to the group that you plan to eliminate, especially terms that have action engendering power. And words that are action engendering, that move people to act, risk being understood as imperatives or institutional commands that bridge from purely linguistic descriptions to the non-linguistic actual behaviors that such terms license or permit. Indeed, sometimes genocide. Most recently, she has been applying this analysis to contemporary American politics, tracking the use of dehumanizing epithets like animals and parasites. And she examines the discursiveness of hate as an effective contagion, a relational malady, manifesting in rapid outbreaks, clustered surges, and exhausting corruption of political vitality. And it is this deploy of epidemiological modeling that has become the portal to which, to what I view as her most exciting insights, the possibilities of inoculation, antidote, and containment. It is, as she points out, rather too easy to insist that the problem of hate speech can simply be met with more speech. That is only half true in a world of politicians who disinform and bully, or of technologically amplified gaslighting, or jittery armed militias high on coded messages from QAnon. In such a moment, knowing what kinds of more speech can actually be heard and what kinds of more speech have a chance of quelling passions, this is a paramount performance. Never has it been more important to understand the aesthetics of conspiracy narratives or how logical argument can be overridden with the theatrics of disrespect, congealing into walls, weapons, and the felt necessity of death, despite our best professions of never again. So we are incredibly lucky to have her here and have her here now. Her presence tonight couldn't be better time. Lynn. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm truly humbled by it. And thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I'm especially grateful to our hosts at Northeastern and Harvard and to our organizers and tech specialists for pulling this session together so beautifully. Um, my problem with, with my talk today, I'll warn you in advance, should never do this, is um, way too much to talk about given everything that's been going on. So I decided to just focus on uh, some of the structural issues and, um, and we'll see um, what comes out in the Q&A um, about that, <clears throat> excuse me. So what does it matter if our speech practices abandon truth, license violence and instill fear? That's my opening question. And my short answer is it matters tremendously to our capacities to function as rational, autonomous and happily related beings in the world. We're social. So it matters what is said to us and about us. Speech matters to our physical well-being and to our very health. We're made of flesh and blood and bones, but we're also made of words and ideas, norms and practices and expectations. I'm concerned with the ways that harms to this cell that's made of words and ideas, social relations, family histories, life plans, narratives, and so on, how harms to this phenomenal being can result in harms to our bodies, sometimes life-threatening harms. As I'm sure you all know, we are right now in the midst of a viral pandemic that has already taken almost 450,000 lives. How have words shaped this? Words didn't make the virus, but how have they shaped that death toll? We are faced with rising ethno-nationalism and blatant white supremacy, which got pushed back a few feet by the defeat of Trump, but which is still part of the culture and politics of our country. But today I wanna to talk about the everyday toxins, the ones we learn to live with, adapt to, and which we may be complicit in spreading, doing harm as we go. And that's because I think that those everyday toxins are why we are faced with rising ethno-nationalism and blatant white supremacy, and why we are not in control of this pandemic. So speech matters because we are discursive beings. We talk and talk and talk and talk. 
Our talk is intertwined in nearly all our practices, constituting our ways of life. We play all kinds of language games, engage in speech practices that ennoble some and harm others. We use language to make promises, contracts, and other binding transactions, to entertain and delight, and to castigate and to condemn, and so much more. We should keep in mind that discursive practices, as a philosopher, we tend to talk a lot about how language fosters belief. But we have to keep in mind that discursive practices, our speech, is not just about inculcating belief. It's also about desire and affiliation. So us-them polarization, for example, is rooted in a need to belong. <clears throat> and so is rooted in personality needs and social life. Language imbues all this. As the 20th century philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein has said, a language is a way of life. If we want to protect rights, and I do, we need to consider the discursive practices that construct and reshape our ways of life. Sometimes this is by overt attempts to impose or inculcate particular ideologies, but it's often from average everyday practices that go unnoticed or may <clears throat> in fact be welcomed. When we consider things like the stress that rises, that's, that uh, arises from the uh, increased ethno-nationalism in Europe and white supremacy in the US in recent years, what we see is that millions of people have experienced significant uh, biopsychosocial harms from the stress created by, in our case, the Trump regime's lack of transparency, anti-democratic tendencies, human rights violations, and their whiplash pronouncements. That isn't even to, to address specific claims made about, um, you know, there are good people on both sides or um, slurs against ethnic and racial groups. When Trump was defeated in November, 2020, um, social media revealed that many people began to feel anxieties ease, depression lift and fear abate. Of course, it came right back, realizing that the social structures that made Trump possible um, and the violence that followed in January um, uh, indicated that our problems were not over. Okay. So there are two models that I wanna talk about um, for understanding toxic speech. But first I should tell you something about what toxic speech is. Toxic was the OED word of the year in 2018, much to my dismay, um, because I started talking about toxic speech back in 2015, and I felt like the concept got really watered down. Um, mostly it's used as an intensifier term, and we have toxic everything. Um, but there's a way in which I should not be dismayed by that, because in fact, our society is getting really toxic for a lot of people. Um, and what does that mean? It means the social structures, our practices, the way we talk to and about each other um, are not serve our well being. So, what do I mean by toxicity? I take it really seriously. I, I mean it quite literally. Toxicity is the degree to which a substance can harm humans or animals. So, arsenic, lead, and polonium are physical toxins. Mold is a toxin naturally occurring in refrigerators across the country as we speak, but still we know to avoid it. We know these are toxins because we can track the damage they do. Similarly, toxic speech must be identified by the harms it inflicts. These start out in the normative realm of speech behaviors, but gain their power from their impact in non-speech effects and situations. So with this conception, we can see that toxic speech is defined by outcomes or effects. Those effects can range from mild to dire, can be somewhat variable across individuals and groups, and yet are often easily predicted. As an aside, I should mention that um, there are toxins that we live with and actually seek out every day. I don't know how many of the people in this webinar have a glass of wine with dinner, but alcohol is a toxin. Right? But it's a toxin that many people can control and they can, um, they can monitor its effects 
And for some people, it's, it's out of control and they cannot monitor the effects. Uh, chemotherapy is a toxin. It's a, it's a range of toxins that are designed to promote health in the long run, but inflict incredible harms in the short run. So toxins are complicated and we need to, um, we need to understand them as connected to a system. Um, so it's something is toxic for an organism. And then the question of whether it's causing harm has to do with some kind of baseline conception of what well-being and well-functioning for that organism or being is. Okay, my emphasis on harms is importantly different from views that emphasize offense. In the literature on hate speech and um, uh, derogatory terms, very often you'll find people talking about offense, running, uh, slurs together with insults and so on. Many philosophers are careful not to do that, but it's important to distinguish offense from harm. Um, and often offense is a poor indicator of harm. With social harms, like the degradation that comes from longstanding oppression, um, say uh, an enslaved person who thinks that slavery is natural, that person isn't going to take offense at what are actually human rights abuses because they think that's their place in life. That is um, a clear case where offense fails as a measure, but we can see the harm that has been done to them by the ideological imposition of uh, toxic social structures. Okay, so harms are injuries. Um, and they inflict or constitute damage. Toxic speech brings morbidity and mortality. That is, it can make you sick and it can even kill. And that sounds hyperbolic, but it's not. As we saw on January 6th, uh, the ideology that got people to be uh, insurgents at the Capitol led to actual deaths. Now, how urgent toxic speech is might depend might seem to depend to you on your social position. If you're an affluent, educated white American with a comfortable home and a secure job and maybe even a good nest egg, it's pretty easy to think of toxic speech as only words to take a key phrase from Catherine McKinnon, something to be tolerated for the greater good of freedom of expression. But if you're someone of any class or group who has been routinely targeted with such speech, whose defenses have been built up across a lifetime of harms, then the situation may be very urgent, not simply a matter of words alone, but a matter of norms and practices that are in crucial ways not made to foster your well-being. Everyday speech acts, either directed at you or around you, harm you in both major and minor ways. Let me circle back to that concept of norms and practices <clears throat> that are uh, in crucial ways not made to foster your well-being. Norms and practices are carried in, uh, we carry them in two ways. We carry them through what we say and we carry them through what we do. And we recognize there's a very blurry line between those as categories. Uh, speech is a way of acting and very often acting has uh, semantic and pragmatic force. So the idea is that when we are um, looking at how speech harms, we have to look at the speech as, as carrying norms, conveying norms, and being part of practices. Okay. So um, the German linguist, Victor Klemperer, was, is my, uh, my opening, like the, my first source on this. Um, and he, he chronicled, he was a Jewish um, uh, linguist and, uh, army officer, a decorated army officer who was married to a Gentile during the rise of the Nazis. And they left him alone for a long time and he kept diaries. And in these diaries, he kept track of the linguistic changes of the Third Reich. And he called these poisons, um, like incremental doses of arsenic that went down unnoticed, but eventually caused illness and death. He argued that the poison affected everyone in every station of life, although differently. Now that's a helpful analogy 
for forms of toxic speech that deliver disparagement, microaggressions, slurs, and derogations, often in a daily onslaught. Targets learn to filter the signal from the noise. And that is one of the places that I think we need to put our finger in and say, and what does that cost? That filtering of the signal from the noise. In the US and around the world, the daily tweets from Donald, from Donald Trump were for many just this kind of poison, whether slurring Mexicans or Haitians or endorsing white supremacists or coining disparaging nicknames for his, uh, those he deemed his own enemies. Trump's tweets attacked social groups dismantled democratic values, announcing policy, announced policies randomly and generated a sense of chaos and distraction. This led to widespread anxiety even before the arrival of COVID-19. Let me pause on that for a minute. Anxiety, don't leave that in the cognitive or, or mental realm. Anxiety brings physical reactions too. And so living with anxiety has is, is exactly that kind of biopsychosocial phenomenon. And so it has, has long-term health effects. Okay, in today's world, with online venues delivering speech at incredible speeds across the globe, a viral model of toxic speech is also helpful. In the midst of this global pandemic, which is stronger than ever in the US, a viral model offers a familiar structure and perhaps the right sense of concern. When Jane issues a disparagement of a group or a person because they're a member of her group, her hearers then take it up. Maybe they accept it, maybe they reject it, but it's theirs now, in mind, and unerasable. Like a virus, some forms of toxic speech spread from individual to individual, sometimes even mutating along the way. Now for that picture of mutation, I ask you to think about the children's telephone game. I don't know how many in the audience have ever played that game. It can be a lot of fun. And if you have enough kids, say at a birthday party or in a classroom, and the first one whispers in the second one's ear, and they go all the way around, the, the fun of it is to see what it turns into by the end. And that's, that's really fun. But what happens with toxic speech is that um, it's like telephone game meets whack-a-mole. So, so we have the uh, telephone game where, you know, Jane says something terrible about someone else and then that gets picked up and, and eventually gets a little bit modified and a little bit modified. And we can't just address it by saying no one is allowed to say that thing anymore because it has, it has given birth to many more. Um, and so that's why I bring whack, a different game, whack-a-mole, in because um, if you say we're going to ban this particular word because we know it has caused harm, um, that might be a thing that you choose to do, but it isn't going to solve the problem because it has offspring and it has mutations. Okay, so um, some so some forms of toxic speech spread from individual to individual and sometimes they're muting along the way. If we think of language as a dynamic set of social practices governed by inferences, guided and guiding by guiding and guided by perception, emotion, and the conditions of our lives, we'll recognize that language always acts in concert with collateral social practices. So don't think, oh, well, that's a bad word. If we take it out, it's going to go away because it was supported by so other social practices and those are going to um, just grab onto that mutated variation. So a key aspect of the social practice approach to language that I use is that what we say has normative significance. Utterances license other speakers to, utterances license speakers to take up what's been said and use it. So this is a normative view rooted in permissions and responsibilities. It might seem conservative just carrying along what's been said before, but bear in mind that an utterance may cohere with or disrupt norms. They issue licenses in every case. Understanding this normative dimension of our speech is crucial for understanding how speech can harm. So if I assert that Joe Biden won the 2020 US presidential election, I license you to repeat it. 
a Trump fan might challenge me and I could point to facts to defend my assertion. By answering the challenge well, my entitlement to say it would stand and the licenses I issued would stand. This is one of the places where we're in really big trouble right now because the question of what counts as answering it well is not uniformly understood or it's not answered uniformly. Okay, so language games, they have ways we get into the game, ways that we play within it, that language, language moves. And then we have ways that we exit. We speak to do things, to get things done in the world. And this is something that um, Professor Williams picked up in the introduction that, you know, the, the um, my analysis of the genocidal uh, language um, was in Rwanda was not about, let's just play this language game. It was about preparing people to participate in the slaughter of their fellow and sister citizens. Um, so the entrance moves. If members of one group are systematically excluded from entering language games that matter for self-construction and definition, if they lose the authority to define and shape their world, then that's an attack on their freedom of expression, their dignity, and their autonomy. That's going to have real life consequences to their ability to take care of themselves in the world. Those internal moves, if they're allowed into the game or practice, but then they're denied the same powers within it as nearly all players have, then this is similarly a threat to their capacity to take care of themselves and others. We see this a lot with um, women and people of color who are allowed a seat at a table in a, in a business or enterprise of some sort, and then their speech acts just seem to float off into the air um, and have no impact. Um, when with exit moves, those are uh, what Professor Williams highlighted as action engendering moves. We speak to do things to get things done in the world. So when the president of the US slurs Mexicans again and again while refusing to denounce white supremacist militias, a toxic brew of race violence at the US southern border is licensed by his speech acts. Now I've already given it away by saying a toxic brew of race violence is licensed, right? He is licensing those exit moves. Some of these utterances border on explicit incitement while others are just evasive enough to the use of what Jennifer Saul calls dog whistles and fig leaves to get him off the incitement charge, but nevertheless to signal to his, his followers that this behavior is licensed. And as an aside, um, often Donald Trump doesn't speak in complete sentences. So that makes the audience complete the assertion, which is a, um, way to evade his own responsibility for the incitement and other harms. Um, okay, I want to, I want to um, if we think about us then polarization just briefly, um, I want to have, I want to tell you a story and this is um, this is a story written by my friend, Jean Bosco Rudigengua, who, is a, who was a survivor of the genocide of the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994. And it's from his book, Love Prevails. And as I, I'm gonna read this to you so I, so I get it exactly right. But as I read this, um, I ask you to please think what in your life has been like this if anything. So um, Jean Bosco says, school started with a routine that always made me anxious. Our teacher ordered Tutsi children to stand up every morning. I always rose slowly, frightened. A few other children in the classroom did the same while the rest of the students stared, feeling sorry for us. I remember I always got a fluttery feeling in the stomach every time the teacher started the ethnic roll call. We remained standing for a brief moment, but it was the most terrifying experience of my school time. My friend Abraham was among those who remained seated. He was a Hutu. That was all right. He was always nice to me and we remained friends. 
the ads. You can sit down now, the teacher always said, putting down his list. He never asked us for anything, and I did not exactly understand this bizarre ritual. As you let this moment sink in, I ask you to think about the times when you felt that flutter of fear in your gut because of something someone said. It might not have been an overt threat. It might not have involved any slurs or hate speech, and yet something about the speech act brought on fear, anxiety, or wariness. John Bosco remembers the physical effects of fear that was never explained or justified, of the fear from a daily practice that was never explained or justified. In my genocidal language games, I emphasize the kinds of everyday speech acts that fostered and maintained the social categories and generated permissions or licenses for violence when the call came. This is just such a practice. In the analysis that follows, the adult Jean Bosco knows that individuals were caught up in a social mechanism that was beyond their understanding at the time and which had tremendous power over their lives. This is not to excuse them, but to, to warn us. This practice just hanging there in the daily lives of the school children had no obvious purpose to them except to take the role. But why by ethnic categories? The reasons would become clear as the practices developed across society and over time. So it is this kind of practice and so many others that I want us to pay closer attention to before it is too late. One of the things that we need to do is recognize that when we find ourselves in a situation where we have a physical response, like the flutter in the stomach, right? Um, that we are called in that moment to understand that something bigger than that individual to individual action may be happening and that we should move outward and see on the macro level what's going on in the society and what the social power is that's being enacted in that moment. Okay, last thing, because I know I'm, we're running out of time. Um, um, when we think about what to do or what's going on, I want you to think of this a concept from uh, medicine and uh, a little bit from epidemiology. I want you to think about this question, how much stress are you carrying? We don't all carry the same allostatic load. Allostatic load is a concept for measuring uh, stress. Um, I think to see the health issues of toxic speech, most clearly we need to consider stress. Some stress is useful and it helps us to do our best, but toxic stress is not well tolerated. It causes damage to multiple dimensions of a person's well being. And so when you are a member of a society that routinely looks the other way as other people in the society impose norms on you through their discursive practices um, that cause, that is they inflict social harms that cause um, material harms to you. I think it's very important to face that stress rise to the meta level and see the social dimensions and then ask, what can we do about it? More speech isn't gonna be the only thing that we can do. We need to address, we need to, we need to respond to the speech by challenging it, if that's safe. Um, we need allies who will challenge it, but we also need to look at the social structure that that language is holding up and address that and find out how we can, um, how we can undo it. So I haven't said much about inoculations or antidotes. We can talk about them in the, in the Q and A, but I hope I've given you some concepts that will help you when you're thinking about um, <clears throat> what people are doing. And if you tend to think, oh, they're just playing a language game. They're just talking to each other. It doesn't really matter. Always think what's the exit move? because you're just looking at it as words to words. And how did that get started? Who gets to play that game? Does everybody get to play or only some people get to play? And how much is identity a factor in that? Um, so when you think about toxins, 
in addition to this language approach, I want you to think about the material of the toxin. What is the toxin? How, what is the dose? Are you getting it every single day in many, many different forms? Well, how is it delivered through speech acts, images, et cetera? How susceptible am I? How susceptible is my friend? Um, and if we keep all of those categories in mind, we may have a fighting chance of fighting toxic speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, I believe we have questions now. Absolutely, and I, um, I have a few. Uh, I would, I would love to, and then there, are, there are a few in the chat as well that I want to share. But I, th I just want to thank you, Lynn. This is so provocative, and of course, so timely. Um, and so, one of the questions I had was sort of a chronological question about what it is or what various factors, linguistic and otherwise, would characterize this particular moment of toxicity from some of the others you cited in, in other moments, including the Rwandan genocide and during World War II. Um, obviously, we're in a digital age where we have this we're constantly saturated in, in language, toxic and otherwise. But I'm just interested to know what are some of the other structural elements that you might identify as distinguishing this moment from some of those others that we should be on the lookout for? Well, I mean, you've hit, hit one thing. So one of the things I look at, I think I muted myself. No, I can hear you. OK, OK. So one of the things that, I mean, I tend to look I'm not a historian and I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a philosopher. So I tend to look for, for patterns of um, structure, right? I tend to look at structures, but um, so I see a lot of similarities across many genocides, across many um, moments of ethnic cleansing. Um, but I also see the same behaviors in societies that are not committing overt genocides. So now I'm gonna say, look, the opening question about what does it, what difference does it make whether we have, whether we're, we have lies and we're dealing with lies and misinformation and truth has gone by the board. Racism is an ideology and set of practices built on lies. And so we, have and white supremacy is a pack of lies. So um, that's a little, you know, um, I don't want to say short, but <laughs> but um, if we if we want to say, well, you know, but that's a genocide that happened over there, and we are in a different situation. And what a lot of people do is they look at specific genocides that the American government has perpetrated against Native Americans, against enslaved peoples and so on. But I think we also need to look at the ideology of incarceration in our country and the way in which mass incarceration is racially uh, separate and racially unequal. Um, and so that's, you know, it's beyond my expertise, but I'm gonna flag that as a direction that is, um, important, but you, you hit on one other thing, which is the digital age. There's a book, uh, there's a French theorist, Paul Virilio, who I, I a lot, not, not a lot of people in my circles read him. I'm glad you know who he is. And so in his, the administration of fear, for instance, yeah. he talks about the speed of communication and it's only gotten more so since he, since he said these things. Um, and I think that the speed of the digital age, the way that um, false claims can uh, uh, just infuse a mode of discourse is really part of our moment. On a somewhat related front, um, less related to chronology, but more related to different language and forms, there's a question on um, 
how these kinds of toxins might change and morph across different languages. I don't know the answer to that. You know, I think what I need to do is have a team where <clears throat> we take this kind of picture and we have someone who's a linguist, like a who does cultural linguistics, who would study that. But I don't actually know how um, particular kinds of uh, toxic speech move from one to another language. Um, that I tend to see them as um, homegrown for the most part, mm -hmm. um, but that may be um, a kind of narrowness to my own vision that I should um, think about because um, with the ubiquitousness of the internet, um, I don't know how much can be homegrown anymore. Yeah, you know, I wonder about that with language and with the dominance of the English language in so many places. Um, I wonder about it. I wonder about that as well. Could could I just follow up and ask you to really to, to, to push on you just a little bit about the, the question of inoculation and antidote? Um, because, uh, you know, as we speak, there is, you know, we have a Congress dealing with a Congress person. Um, who's used the most vile and over the top uh, Nazi language, um, uh, death dealing language, actual threats of death and threats of assassination. And there seems to be some hesitation. So I'd like you to address the problem of deniability, mm. um, the, the, you know, the, the, the part of the difficulty of, the, you know, of language or expression of pushback um, is, is not just that words aren't going to hurt you, it's that I didn't really mean it. Um, and, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, that the, the, this kind of language is ungovernable. And that has a very literal meaning when it comes to Congress and legislators and in, in this context. And I'm, I'm perplexed and scared by what's happening with, uh, with Congressperson um, Green. That so many so, people are using to acknowledge that danger. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think she's um, beyond the beyond the. I was going to say beyond the pale, but I think it's a bad metaphor. Um, <laughs> she's um, in Congress. That's within the castle. <laughs> she's, yeah. No, I know. And and um, but so so let me first address the. I didn't really mean it. Um, if you're talking with a friend and your friend says something a little off, and you say did you mean that, right? And they say, and you, what did you hear, right? And you tell them what you heard and they say, no, no, I didn't mean that. And then they give you a correction. That's a case of more speech, right? And because the correction actually goes with whatever they said, um, um, you know, suppose they say something that is um, negative about a mutual friend, but you, owe, you thought they always liked that person. You have a body of prior statements that they've made and then this thing they say doesn't fit. And so you say, oh, did you mean that? And they say, what did you hear? You repeat it and explain how you took it. And they say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. And they give you a new version. They reinterpret what they said, right? That kind of, I didn't mean that. I can live with that. I can live with saying, oh, you misspoke. It was, it was what J.L. Austin calls a misfire. You didn't say it when you see what you said, you, you work to take it back. When, when people say Donald Trump didn't mean it when he said he was gonna have Muslim bans and he was gonna build a wall and they're gonna vote for him because he's so interesting, but he doesn't mean any of that. That is just irresponsibility. That's not, um, so, so in the case of your friend, you, you're saying, did you mean that? Is calling them to responsibility. And then they take the responsibility to clarify and uh, and they even may try to take it back. They can't completely take it back, but they can. Um, with the case of the several people in Congress who are, I think, out of control and um, fostering and fomenting um, not just hate, but sedition and not just dislike, but violence against other members of Congress. Um, 
anyone who doesn't hold them to account for it is complicit and you have to ask why. And I think that's where we see um, a lack of attention to the speech acts um, as not understanding the licenses that they are issuing that are licenses to violence. Um, so, I mean, I think that um, Pat, you know this really well, part of the problem is the protection of political speech. And so if we think that political speech is supposed to be protected under law and you cast this stuff as political speech, then I think that's a problem. And I don't think it should be protected as political speech because it isn't saying, I think that the relief bill should have this much money instead of that much money. Or I think we should have this political view versus that one. I think if you're talking about how can I find this congressperson's office so I can kill her? That's not political speech anymore. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and again, it still troubles me because it isn't, it feels to me more than license. There have been instances in which people in power are giving commands, it's imperative language. Um, and that move to the imperative and then, and, and then a kind of collective gathering around saying that that's not what you meant. Uh, that's, that's more than complicity, that's cover up. You know, it, 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 it worries me that we're in a very cynical mood in which there is um, open call to language of assassination and people are play acting or there's a theatrics of, of, you know, of denial. And that's, that, that's, that's, the, that's what I wonder, how can we, what can we do? Is it too late to do something against uh, about that? Um, that requires, um, uh, as you say, something other than complicity. It requires a kind of discipline. And I, I, I'm very worried about how our political collective within what people think of, they have, they've pushed the bounds of, of this as a normative political speech. I mean, how do you get outside? How do you break a norm that's, that's genocidal? It's, um, I, I, I love this line of questioning because, um, so the, the idea that the license is an imperative, that's gonna depend upon the authority of the speaker, right? And so if that person is taken as authoritative by the um, hearer, then what would to most people be a license would in fact to the hearer who takes that person to be authoritative be um, um, an imperative, which is part of why when um, in Rwanda, um, you know, <laughs> why uh, Simon Bikindi was found guilty of genocide for asking why are these Tutsis still alive, right? It's a question, right? He could say, oh, I was just asking a question. No, he wasn't just asking a question. That question was actually an imperative given his place in the Hutu regime. And so, he can't weasel out of it. He tried in court, but the, the ICTR said no. So um, I think that's really important. There's another element to, to the concern about Congress that I think is, is worth keeping in mind as a parallel to everyday life. So often when people say toxic things, other people don't say anything back about it. They let it hang there. Um, of politeness and rules of decorum. And I think the parallel in, and they, and they just kind of like move on or change the subject um, instead of saying, what did you say? And I think, what did you say is a really good question to start the interrogation. Um, but, but with the Congress, um, I think there's a lot of uh, fear and kind of boomerang fear if we start um, in investigating other members of Congress, how much of that's gonna be um, a pattern and practice that is going to boomerang back against us when the regime changes and so on. And so uh, I think I, I'd, I'd wanna have uh, more, um, I'd, love to, I'd love to have a longer conversation about that because I think that the, um, there are people who do want to hold her to account 
and who want to see her removed from Congress. And I, I'm hoping that that does happen um, because of these um, uh, blatant assaultive speech acts that she has done. And I like your idea of thinking of them as imperatives. And I think that many of Trump's speech acts were actually imperatives to his followers because he created a kind of cult. Mm -hmm. And so within that cult, he had this kind of very strong authority so that it was like, you know, your wish is my command. So I don't think she's, I don't think she's there yet. I think she wants to be there. I think that's what she wants. We have so many questions in the chat and I know we won't have time to get to all of them. So I'm, I'm going to bring two of them that I, I feel like kind of work together. One um, from Naomi Sheeman. Uh, hi, Naomi. Thank hi, you. Hi, Naomi. Um, can you speak to the role, possible limitations or dangers of humor, especially satire as inoculation or antidote, which I love the question because it speaks to the weaponization of, oh, I was just joking, um, which is often, you know, spoken after the fact. And so that one, and then also a question from Daniela Gandorfer, and I want to try to, uh, it's kind of long. So um, toxic speech as presented is very interesting. It seems to tie bodies, matter, and meaning together. Excellent. So does the claim that anxiety is a biopsychological -psycho social phenomenon, um, this to me pushes towards an understanding of language that is not representative or one of its powerful functions is not toxicity. Perhaps anxiety, for example, is not mediating either, but registering, sensing, and modifying modes of life, making some modes of life possible and others impossible. Can language be understood in a way that is physical, biological, chemical, forceful, not as effect, but broader phenomenon? That's a lot. <laughs> it's a great. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I got all of that, but, but I do think so let me, let me address that and come back to Naomi on um, satire and humor. Um, because I think if I do answer Naomi first, I'm gonna lose track of this longer question. Um, I think that very often when we respond with anxiety, it's because we are um, attentive to um, not just what philosophers of language would call the illocutionary act that happened, but the um, perlocutionary force. And, but for me, it's beyond that. It's, it's, um, it's that we can see down the road. When I was learning how to drive, my father told me I had to be able to see, I, like he, he'd quiz me, what's happening four cars ahead? What's happening four cars behind? And, and um, too often, you know, we're like, just looking in the, in the very near future or the very near past. Um, so anxiety um, and fear can be ways that we are picking up on um, subtle messages and cues, some of which are discursive and some of which might be non-discursive from our interlocutors. And those are often survival mechanisms. Part of the thing is they, they um, initiate the fight, flight, freeze response, which releases cortisol, which is part of our stress reaction, right? And so, but it can be life-saving. So I don't want to say, oh, let's get rid of all anxiety. We're going to all just be, you know, happily ever after sitting around grooving. Um, we're going to have anxiety at times, but we want it to be uh, something that is um, not rooted in systemic injustice. And when the anxiety is the result of systemic injustice, I think we need to notice that that's where it's coming from and then address the systemic injustice. Um, I don't think I answered the entire question, but I hope that's a kind of a, a clue to where I would go with it. Um, on satire as, and um, the weaponization of humor and using humor as a denial, um, I think it's really important that some of the language that is part of toxic that is that is often used as a weapon can be deflated through humor. I think that that's something that um, 
I don't know how to do uh, personally. I'm, I'm not good at that. Um, and I haven't seen very many comedians who actually achieve it, but I think it's something that um, uh, we can do. My model of that, I talk about this in one of my papers, um, um, is the, an organization in Germany that mocked the, the Nazis by um, dressing up as clowns and then um, walking so, sort of beside them. And for every mile they marched, they raised money for an exit Nazism um, organization. And so they used humor and they were mocking the Nazis on their march, um, but they used humor to deflate their power. And I think that's very clever. There are also cases of um, um, counter protesters um, throwing white flour and, and shouting out white flour instead of white power um, and things like that. And you know, so I think it's possible, um, but I don't think that humor is always a frame that gets the speaker off the hook. And I think that's really important. So that's gonna be a case by case nuance thing. I would trust Naomi Sheeman to be able to like work on those analyses because she's got such a um, philosophical and poetic mind at the same time. Um, but that's what it would take is a kind of very clear um, literary and um, analytic analysis at the same time. I have a, there's a question from uh, Lori Lefkowitz that I wanna ask that gets at the question of anxiety um, and trauma, uh, generational trauma as well. Um, uh, she asks about the epigenetic research on children and grandchildren of trauma survivors um, who have high stress measured by cortisol um, and how triggering Trump's rhetoric and its consequences have been for children of Holocaust survivors immigrants from fascist regimes, um, descendants of slaves. Um, so her question is about the intergenerational trauma and health consequences of triggers. And then I'm just gonna tag on the end of that. What are the metrics by which we can track um, the impact of this kind of toxicity on these specific uh, embodied people uh, with these traumatic pasts that, uh, that Lori has signaled? Um I don't know the metrics yet, um, but there's work going on in um, in Rwanda with survivors' children, um, uh, mostly by psychologists, not as much by physicians. Um, but I do think that the um, epigenetic research, um, what it tells me is it gives us all the more reason to focus on what's happening now because um, these, these speech norms, practices, and the entire range of diction that we have at our fingertips is our legacy to our children and to their children. And I mean that um, for everyone, whether you have children or not, um, it's our legacy to the next generations. So, um, um, I don't know enough about the biochemistry of epigenetics to know how to answer the markers question, but I do know there is that research going on. And so that would be something that would be pretty, pretty easy to find. We are, we have a ton of questions, but we're kind of nearing the end. Um, so uh, let's see. There are so many, I don't even know where to start. And Pat, I wanna also allow you if you have another question to or comment to make. Um, I think that um, there was a question, let me just go back up. There was a question I was sort of interested in hearing an answer to, let's see. Um, There are so many. Thank you. There are a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, my my aging eyes are having trouble reading through all of them. They're really, really rich. So I can jump in on one. I see one from Susan Bryson, where she yeah. says, "But what about what when you're yeah. 
Yeah. What about when your bodily responses are untrustworthy? Yes. Like the 9-11, the white woman who called 9-11 on the African-American man who was bird watching in Central Park. Oh, I want to put in a plug right here for a movie that's coming out, a documentary called The Call by Chico Colvard. Mm. Um, I don't know when it's coming out. He has a Guggenheim now to um, finish it up, but it's about those 9-11 calls um, and it's going to be very powerful. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. So why, how, and when people should not take their bodily responses of fear at face value. And I think the, the answer to that is we really have to look at the socials, our, our own social situation. So if you're afraid, why are you afraid? Ask, ask yourself, what is it that is making you afraid right here? And is there a different thing you can do besides assault the person who you think is a worry, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that the woman who called 9-11 um, in Central Park um, was the aggressor. Mm -hmm. And I think it was an act of racial aggression. I do not think she was ever afraid, um, but suppose she was afraid. Fight flight freeze. She didn't do any of the, well, she did, she fought, but she didn't fight him. She, um, she called on institutional powers and brought them to bear because she thought they were on her side and that, that he had no right to be there. Um, so I think it's, I think that we each have um, a responsibility to look at the responses that we, the, at, at our emotional responses, and also to ask, how did I get this way? And how I, how, how I got this way may have to do with um, the social construction of identity, your social construction of identity as a privileged white woman, for instance, um, your social construction of identity as someone who has um, uh, to take a different social position, who has to be careful um, being out alone at night, um, someone who has to be careful being in this neighborhood or that neighborhood and so on. Where did it, where did that um, uh, identity come from? And where is, your, so, so to Susan, I'm not taking your responses, anyone's responses as biological givens. In the same way that I don't take desires as biological givens, it's social construction pretty much all the way down but pay attention to it. When you feel it, pay attention and ask, where is this coming from? And then what will I do with it? And when you ask, what will I do with it? That's when you start getting into inoculations and antidotes. And can you have a more constructive response that will promote your health and the health of others? Or are you going to just feed the beast and let it keep growing? Thank you so much. We're totally at the end of our time. We have kept everybody a little bit longer. I want to remind everybody that this will be available, a recording will be available on the websites for both the Mahindra Humanity Center and Northeastern's Humanity Center. And I just want to thank Lynn Terrell again for a fantastic and incredibly timely and amazing talk. Thank you for your generosity and thank everyone for being here. And please mark your calendar for March 10th for Entangled Nuclear Colonialisms um, in just a month. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much, Lynn. Take care. Thank you.